Welcome back to Falcon Physician Review's online review for USMLE Step 1. This is Microbiology Module 6, Antibiotics 2. We're going to continue talking about penicillins, we'll discuss the cephalosporin family, then we'll go on to the, in the protein synthesis inhibiting antibiotics. Finally, we'll talk about the fluoroquinolones. Welcome to Microbiology Module 6, Falcon Physician Review's online review for USMLE Step 1. We're going to continue our discussion about antibiotics and spend a few slides talking about bacterial vaccines. First, with the penicillins, you have to know that there's a history behind penicillins. The first penicillin ever discovered was penicillin G. After that, there were amino penicillins, which include ampicillin and amoxicillin. These improved gram-negative coverage. Penicillin G was really only good for gram-positive organisms. Then there was a need for a penicillinase-resistant penicillin, which includes methicillin, oxacillin, and nafcillin. These cover methicillin-sensitive Staph aureus. Next, we had anti-pseudomonal penicillins, which include carbenicillin, ticarcillin, piperacillin, and mesloscillin. These cover gram-negative rods much better than the previous penicillins did. Finally, you have the cousins of the penicillins, which are the cephalosporins. These are more resistant to beta-lactamases, but they are susceptible to cephalinosporinases. The bacteria have beta-lactamase, which cleaves the beta-lactam bond in penicillins and inactivates the antibiotic. So we have come up with beta-lactamase inhibitors. Cladulanic acid is one example of that, and you'll find that in augmentin, which is basically amoxicillin with cladulanic acid. Timentin is ticarcillin with cladulanic acid. Sulbactam and tazobactam do the same thing as cladulanic acid. They bind with beta-lactamase, and they inhibit it competitively so it doesn't bind to the drug. Ampicillin and sulbactam is called unison. Piperacillin and tazobactam is called zosin. One note on USMLE Step 1, you definitely need to know the generic names. You will probably not be tested very frequently on the brand names, such as zosin or unison. So a beta-lactam antibiotic is a penicillin. Clavulanic acid is added to penicillins to competitively inhibit the beta-lactamase, which the bacteria make to kill the, to kill the penicillin. Cephalosporins are grouped by generations. The first generation was quite narrow spectrum. It was good for gram positives and it had some gram negative coverage. It was good for penicillin allergic patients. It's good for cellulitis and we often give it prior to surgery. Examples of first generation cephalosporins include cephalexin and cephazolin. Second generation cephalosporins expanded the spectrum and had better coverage for gram-negative rods. These were good for pneumococcus and H. flu. They also treated Enterobacter and Proteus. Examples of second generation cephalosporins include cefuroxime, cefachlor, cefoxetin, and cefotetan. By the time you get to the third generation, you really are quite broad spectrum. These are good for multi-drug resistant gram-negatives and nosocomial infections. Ceftriaxone is the most popular third generation, but you also have cefotaxime, ceftazidime, cefixime, and cefpodoxime. Ceftriaxone, you'll need to remember, is good for meningitis. The fourth generation cephalosporins are the most potent we have, and they're very good against pseudomonas. Examples include cefepime and cefoperazone. Let's go to a question. A two-year-old female presents to your office with a two-day history of fever and irritability. Her mom reports that she had an upper respiratory tract infection one week ago. Your otoscopic exam reveals a dull, bulging, erythematous tympanic membrane. She attends daycare, and you're concerned about the possibility of a beta-lactamase-producing strain of strep pneumo. All of the following would be appropriate antibiotic choices except. So we have pneumococcus and we're worried about beta-lactamase producing pneumococcus. So we need to look through and find antibiotics that would allow us to address those concerns. As you scan through the choices, you can notice that there are some differences. Amoxicillin is an early penicillin, and usually strep pneumococcus is resistant to amoxicillin. Ticarcillin has clavulanic acid with it, which is a beta-lactamase competitive inhibitor. Nafcillin is a good cephalosporin that has pneumococcal activity, and cefuroxime is a third generation cephalosporin, which, use, which really should do the job. So as we look through the choices, amoxicillin is the one which would be a poor choice to send this little, two, this little two year old back to her daycare with. Next question. 
you're called on cross cover to assess a patient being treated for MRSA endocarditis. The nurse is concerned because the patient has angioedema, flushed skin, rash, pruritus, and hypotension despite a recent bolus of vancomycin. You, know, you inform her that the patient's condition is a result of. So we look through this situation. We've got MRSA endocarditis, and so we have to treat this gram-positive bug with vancomycin. Things seem to be going well except for all these symptoms we have, the flushed skin, the rash, the itching, and hypotension. This is something that you have to know. One of the, one of the side effects of vancomycin is the so-called red man syndrome, and the symptoms are exactly as described. It happens when you give a sudden bolus of vancomycin and you get all these symptoms. So you don't have MRASA sepsis from inadequate antimicrobial therapy in choice A. You're treating it adequately. You don't have a concurrent cellulitis infection. Cellulitis wouldn't show up like this and cause hypotension so quickly. You don't have cardiogenic shock secondary to mitral valve failure. There's nothing in the question stem that would lead us to believe that. But you do have a side effect from antibiotic therapy. Other beta-lactams include carbapenems, and ibapenem is a good example of that. This is the broadest antimicrobial activity of all antibiotics, but it doesn't have MRSA coverage or oxicillin resistant staph. We often give it with psilostatin to inhibit the breakdown in the kidney. Astrionum is a monobactam, and that kills gram negatives quite well. Vancomycin is a good medicine to be familiar with. It kills all gram positive organisms, including MRSA. It complexes with the D ALA, D ALA to inhibit transpeptidation. Resistance can occur by changing the pentapeptide structure of peptidoglycan from D ALA, D ALA to D ALA, D LAC. Next, we'll talk about inhibition of protein synthesis. We have specific targets in the bacterial ribosomes, such as the 30S ribosomal site. The two groups of antibiotics which inhibit this are the aminoglycosides and the tetracyclines. The aminoglycosides irreversibly bind the 30S ribosome, which makes them bactericidal, like gentamicin. You can get resistance if the bugs mutate the ribosomal binding site, if they decrease the uptake, of the uptake of the aminoglycoside, or if they enzymatically modify the antibiotic. Tetracyclines block tRNA binding to the 30S ribosome and the mRNA complex. This is bacteriostatic and won't kill the bacteria all the time but it will give you time for your own immune system to take care of the bugs. You can re get resistance if you don't penetrate, if you actively efflux the antibiotic out of the cell, or if you protect the 30S ribosome. This figure nicely illustrates the antibiotics which, inhabit, which attack the bacterial ribosome. You have the 30S inhibitors and the 50S inhibitors. You can see the aminoglycosides and the tetracyclines bind to the 30S subunit. So you have the tetracycline binding to the ribosome and the mRNA complex. The 50S inhibitors include chloramphenicol and clindamycin, erythromycin, lincomycin, and linazolid. This is a good figure to be familiar with. It especially helps you remember which antibiotics attack protein synthesis in the bacteria. Speaking of aminoglycosides, we have a list here that includes streptomycin, gentamicin, tobramycin, amikacin, neomycin, and netilmycin. The main side effects you get from aminoglycosides that you want to be aware of is ototoxicity. So if you have somebody with a hearing defect who starts out with, you're not going to want to put them on an aminoglycoside. Also, if you have somebody in kidney failure, they can get problems with nephrotoxicity, and neuro blo neuromuscular blockade is occasionally seen. The mechanism of action of aminoglycosides, as we've talked about, is to inhibit the 50S ribosome. Tetracycline and doxycycline include side effects which have GI irritation, like nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. You'll get photosensitivity. Kidney and liver toxicity are rare. And teeth discorrelation, which happens when it chelates calcium in children and in the fetus of women taking tetracycline. We use tetracycline and doxy on zoonoses, like chlamydia, mycoplasma, acne, and other intracellular organisms. When we inhibit protein synthesis at the 50S ribosome site, we talk about macrolides and clindamycin and chloramphenicol. Macrolides reversibly bind the 50S ribosome. They block peptide elongation, and therefore they're bacteriostatic, like azithromycin. You can get resistance by methylating your 23S ribosomal subunit. You can enzymatically cleave the medicine, or you can actively efflux it out of the 
bacterial cell through a membrane pump. Clindamycin binds the 50S ribosome and blocks peptide elongation. This inhibits peptidyl transferase by interfering with the binding of amino acid acyl tRNA complex. You can get resistance by methylating the 23S ribosomal RNA subunit. Chloramphenicol binds peptidyl transferase, the component of the 50S ribosomal subunit, blocking peptidal elongation. It's therefore bacteriostatic. You can get resistance from a plasmid encoded chloramphenicol transferase, or you can alter your outer membrane proteins. And one of the big side effects you'll want to know about chloramphenicol is aplastic anemia. You'll also hear about gray baby syndrome, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The macrolides include erythromycin, clarithromycin, and azithromycin. The main side effects you see with these are GI upset, GI upset, like abdominal pain or diarrhea. These are effective against atypical pneumonia like mycoplasma, chlamydia, and legionella. Clindamycin covers anaerobic infections. Side effects you worry about with clindamycin is frequently pseudomembranous colitis from Clostridium difficile. What happens with clindamycin is that it's so good at killing the normal flora of the gut it allows Clostridium difficile to build up, and then you get pseudomembranous colitis. And that's a difficult thing to find in the hospital, and it's frequently talked about on USMLE Step 1. Chloramphenicol has severe side effects like we talked about. Bone marrow suppression can lead to aplastic anemia. And gray baby syndrome is where you cannot conjugate in the liver of babies. You get shock, abdominal distension, and cyanosis. We really only use chloramphenicol in a few select situations, because of the terrible side effects. You use it in bacterial meningitis where you have a severe penicillin allergy and when you don't know what the bug is. And you can use it in young children and pregnant women who have Rocky Mountain spotted fever who are otherwise going to die. When you have alteration of cell membranes, you talk about the polymyxins, you talk about bacitracin. These polymyxins are used topically. They have a cationic detergent-like activity when we use them in a cream. You can get resistance, which is when the drug is unable to penetrate the outer membrane. Bacitracin is also used topically. It disrupts cytoplasmic, membr cytoplasmic membranes. You get resistance when you can't penetrate the outer membrane as well. Nucleic acid synthesis is different in bacteria than it is in humans, and they have different enzymes. You have medications which target the DNA machinery. Quinolones inhibit DNA gyrases, or also called toporisomerases. They're required for the supercoiling of DNA, and they bind to the alpha subunit in keeping the bacteria from being able to replicate their DNA. You can get resistance when you alter the alpha subunit of your DNA gyrase, or you can decrease your uptake by the alteration of porins. Metronidazole causes cytotoxic byproducts which disrupt DNA synthesis. You can get resistance when you don't bring in enough of the medicine, uh, or you can eliminate the toxic compounds before they interact. Quinolones have important side effects, and they're important to remember. The most common one you'll hear about is cartilage damage in children. You can get Achilles tendon rupture in kids, and you can also get GI irritation, which is much more common. Some broad-spectrum quinolones include ofloxacin, levofloxacin, and ciprofloxacin. Less frequently used is the narrow-spectrum quinolone, nalodixic acid. You use quinolones when you want to treat gram-negative rods, when you have a urinary tract infection, for intracellular infections, and for chronic osteomyelitis. Metronidazole is treated is, is used to treat first-line therapy for GI or abdominal abscesses in the combination with another antibiotic. And metronidazole, it's important to remember, is the treatment for C. difficile colitis, which you often get from clindamycin. Side effects from metronidazole include a disulfiram-like effect when you drink alcohol. So if you have somebody with C. diff colitis, they're for, fortunately going to be in the hospital most of the time. If they were outpatient, you would want to tell them not to go drink or else they'll have a rough ride. If you want to inhibit nucleic acid synthesis, you talk about rifampin. Rifampin has many RNA effects and especially inhibits transcription. It binds to the DNA-dependent RNA polymerase and inhibits initiation of RNA synthesis. Bacterial resistance to rifampin is caused by altered alteration of the beta subunit of the RNA polymerase, which is chromosomal, or you can have intrinsic resistance in gram-negatives because they don't uptake it as much. Side effects of rifampin include red urine, hepatitis, and also decreased effect of other medications because rifampin induces the cytochrome P450 system. Your Coumadin is less effective, your birth control is less effective, and you have more risk of seizures if you're on Dilantin because it's less effective. 
All these other medicines are metabolized through the cytochrome P450 system, and therefore dilantin and Coumadin and birth control are metabolized more quickly when you're on rifampin, so be aware of that. Anti-metabolite activity includes the making of nucleic acids and inhibiting that in the bacteria. Sulfonamides and dapsone compete with para-aminobenzoic acid, or PABA, and they prevent synthesis of folic acid. You can get resistance by decreasing your permeability barriers, or increasing your permeability barriers, like pseudomonas. Trimethoprim also attacks the synthesis of folic acid by inhibiting dihydrofolate reductase. So both the sulfonamides and trimethoprim work on different parts of the same pathway. You can get resistance to trimethoprim by decreasing your affinity for dihydrofolate reductase or by intrinsic resistance if you use exogenous thymidine. Bactrim, which, which is trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole, exhibits synergism where the two medicines work together. We use it for pneumocystis and for urinary tract infections. Other antibiotics include antituberculo therapy. This is usually a combination of five antibiotics, including isoniazid, rifampin, which we talked about before, pyrazinamide, ethambutol, and streptomycin. Isoniazid inhibits mycolic acid synthesis, and so we don't see it with the other bacterial antibiotics. It's more specific for mycobacteria. It does exhibit hepatotoxicity and requires peroxidine to decrease the metabolism of INH in the liver. This can lead to a neuropathy if untreated. We talked about rifampin ab above. Pyrazinamide is interesting because we don't know how it works, but we know that it kills the mycobacteria. If ambutol, you want to look out for ocular toxicity, you'll get color blindness and you can get blurred vision. It also is hepatotoxic. Nitroferantoin, or macrodantin, is used in the treatment of chronic UTIs. One of the side effects you'll need to remember for that is pulmonary fibrosis. In terms of bacterial vaccines, there are a number of bacterial illnesses which we have been able to eliminate or drastically reduce the frequency of through vaccination programs. The childhood vaccines you should be familiar with are shown in this, form, in this table. The DTP includes diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, uh, and all of these are vaccines bundled together. The other option for these three is the DTAP, which is acellular pertussis, which is what we've been using recently, since 1997. It has, a killed pertussis it has a killed pertussis antigen, and it's re been replaced by four protein components. The HIV is the Haemophilus influenza type B vaccine, and it has a type B capsular polysaccharide conjugated to diphtheria toxoid. Prevnar is against the seven most prevalent conjugates of Streptococcus pneumonia, and geriatric vaccines include the Pneumovex, which gives you uh, 23 capsular polysaccharides of pneumococcus. There are a few other vaccines which are not used on a widespread basis, but more limited. The Neisseria meningitis vaccine is used for people who are at higher risk. Military recruits in close confines, college freshmen in dorms, are good people to think about giving a vaccine to. Especially in outbreaks, they'll have unaffected people get the vaccine so they don't get sick. Type B capsular polysaccharides are non-immunogenic in the Neisseria meningitis. Yersinia pestis, Bacillus anthracis, and the BCG vaccine are, are used on a limited basis. For Yersinia and Bacillus, those are more for people whose occupation or whose service in the military causes them to be likely to be exposed to that. For, your, for Yersinia, it's more endemic areas in the United States and lab workers. For Bacillus anthracis, it's wool sorters and slaughterhouse workers and also military personnel. The BCG vaccine is used in the third world uh, it doesn't prevent pulmonary tuberculosis, but it reduces dissemination in miliary tuberculosis. So if you have somebody who's traveled from overseas or was raised overseas, they might have a scar, they'll have a positive PPD, and they will have gotten the BCG vaccine. In the United States, we don't use that vaccine. Let's do some questions. Which of the following antimicrobials is bactericidal? This is an unusual question for the USMLE Step 1 because it's just a, a straight, you've got to know it cold or else you don't know it. And so if you look through the options, bactericidal antibiotics in this list include streptomycin. Chloramphenicol, erythromycin, and doxycycline are all bacteriostatic. Next question. During an annual visit, an 18-year-old sexually active female is diagnosed with chlamydia. You counsel her on safe sex practices and prescribe a course of doxycycline. Although rare, you advise her that all of the following are potential side effects except. So in this question, we just need to know what the side effects of doxycycline are. 
And so we need to remember that it can affect the kidneys and the liver. You can get GI disturbances like nausea and vomiting. Uh, and you can get discolored teeth. You don't get ototoxicity like you do with the aminoglycosides. Next question. A 43-year-old homeless male presents with a cough, night sweats, weight loss, fatigue. He's got a chest x-ray and sputum samples that show mycobacterium tuberculosis. You initiate multi-drug therapy, and on a follow-up, he complains of recent blurry vision. Knowing the culprit, you discontinue which of the following medications? This question requires you to know the side effects of the medications used to treat tuberculosis. As we recall, rifampin had a number of side effects. None of them seemed to involve blurry vision. In fact, this is a pretty unique side effect, and so you need to remember that it is associated with the thambutol. Next question. A three-year-old child who has received his complete schedule of vaccinations will be immunized against all of the following except. This question just basically needs you to be familiar with the childhood immunizations. We know that Carinibacteria diphtheria is immunized against. We know pertussis is, Haemophilus influenza, and pneumococcus in the Prevnar. Neisseria meningitidis, like we talked about, has a more limited use vaccine for military recruits and young college freshmen. Next question. A 19-year-old male presents to the emergency room with a gunshot wound to the abdomen. During exploratory surgery, you find that his descending colon is perforated and his peritoneal cavity is contaminated with the spilled contents. You repair the damage, start him on clindamycin, and send him to the floor. On post-op day four, he has abdominal cramping, severe diarrhea. Stool studies are positive for toxin. You start him on which of the following antibiotics to treat his di diarrhea. So this is a clinical scenario of C, of, uh, C. difficile colitis due to clindamycin treatment. You need to know that you treat C. Dif C. difficile colitis with metronidazole. This slide is a good summary to remember when you're in a sticky situation when you have a, pr a patient who is pregnant. Things you want to avoid in pregnancy include sulfonamides, aminoglycosides, fluoroquinolones, and the rest are listed below. Most of them are embryotoxic or mutagenic. Some of them have specific toxicities that you'll want to be familiar with. Let's recap Module 6 for Microbiology in the USMLE Review. This is the major antibiotics module. We gave you a lot of lists to go over. It's important to remember the key lists in the last slide of certain syndromes. Also, you should know how different cephalosporin generations attack gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria. You should know how each antibiotic works based on its mechanism within the bacterial cell. Spend the time to get familiar with the antibiotics. It'll help you on the wards and it'll help you on step one. Next up, we're going to go to Module 7, where we're going to talk about gram-positive cocci.